At this point in the series, we are going to explore one of man's most important senses, sight, and how sight interacts with the world, which is through light. Without light, there would be no sight. Light is even defined as something that makes sight possible. Well, what is sight and what are the senses? Sense, a specialized function or mechanism such as sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch by which an animal receives and responds to external or internal stimuli. In the case of sight, external stimuli stimulates the sense organ called the eyes. The external stimuli for the sense of sight is light. Since light came before language, it is understandable that when language came along, one of the earliest words would involve that bright, shining white light that we all see. And you'd be right to assume that. In fact, there are many old words which describe light in many different ways, like the Hebrew or, which describes order, like when nomads packed boxes to strengthen their journey. One old version of the word light is the Proto-Indo-European word luit, which means bright, to shine, and to see. Again, as the sun existed before human beings, it is obvious that the pre-language humans knew of its existence and that it played a big role in their world, like when it disappeared for hours at a time and everything in the world goes dark. What is this thing that the sun floods half of the earth with? When we look at the sun, we see a bright object, but its color changes. In fact, when we see the sun change color, so does everything else. Why is this? That Hebrew word is useful here, as that word or means strength from above, which is true in the case of the sun. When it changes above, so too does it change down below. But we do not need to invoke a magical being to answer this problem. We can be objective and examine the objects in question. One of the simplest examinations would be to detect the difference between light and dark. If we assume we know nothing about light, we can assume that any scientific equipment given to us is just a toy with no relation to light. We need to investigate this for ourselves, and as we do not know what light is, nor what it relates to, we cannot use these instruments. So for our first detection experiment, we will have to use the only instruments we can grasp, our senses. Light warms the body and hurts the eyes. The absence of light cools the body and doesn't hurt the eyes, but it still makes it hard to see objects. With our bodies interacting daily with this ongoing experiment that we cannot stop, we learn that the light in the sky brings warmth, somehow, and it brings objects into sight, somehow. Unless there is too much light, in which case objects fade to white, as opposed to too little light where objects fade to black. So we can discover by experiencing the physical sensations of light that light interacts with objects and provides warmth, and darkness doesn't interact with objects as much, or maybe it does by adding black, and it takes away warmth. So, what can we do next? When clouds go past the sun, they block the light from the sun. This blockage of light can provide us an idea of how the sun interacts with objects around us. It only takes a sliver of cloud cover or the moon to block the light of the sun. So therefore, we can discover that the light has a source. Unlike the rest of the world, our tribe shrugs and says, I don't know. We will figure out what and how that works later. Meanwhile, the rest of the world scrambles to explain that they knew what it was and what it is is a god in a chariot flying across the sky. For now we are satisfied with the idea that the light has a source. We will call it the sun, and the darkness behind the objects in the sun, we will call that a shadow. The difference between direct sunlight and shadow suggests that one attribute of light is that it can be blocked. The difference between the heat of objects in the sunlight compared to those in the shade allows us to suggest that light can add heat to objects. We also detect the difference between objects in sunlight versus those in the shade and can now suggest that light makes objects become more visible. One thing we have observed about light is that it heats up objects. This quantitative property of increasing the temperature of objects is our modern definition of energy. Energy is the quantitative property that must be transferred to an object to heat the object. The word energy comes from Aristotle's word energia, which means work in regard to things in action. This has different effects on different objects. To a rock, it adds heat. To a puddle of rainwater, it dries it up. 
To an egg that's splattered onto a rock, it cooks it. To a human, it can twist the mind and kill, or just change the color of your skin, or it might just brighten your day. To a lizard, it keeps it alive and active. It may take a while for humanity to test all the different effects of putting some objects in the sun and similar objects in the shade to compare the differences. But eventually, one of these objects will interact in the sun in such a way that all the other objects can be measured against it for a standardized conceptual method. There has been many different ways to detect temperatures throughout history, but mercury in glass was the first standardizable one. Mercury was discovered around 1500 BC by the Egyptians. However, they used it for religious and cosmetic purposes. The Chinese and the Tibetans also used mercury, but for a miracle cure and a quick poison, and they didn't see a problem with that, I guess. It wasn't until 1714 that a man by the name of Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit decided to put that expanding metal into a glass tube and mark the glass with a scale that he invented 10 years later. This liquid in glass was known to be a functional tool for detecting temperature, since Hero of Alexandria in around 10 to 70 AD. Fahrenheit had just made the first reliable thermometer. We will return to thermometers in a moment, but until then we can talk about the other observers that are busy studying light by shining it through different mediums. For example, our fishermen have discovered that when they reach into the water to grab a fish, they miss. Not only that, but their forearms separate from their original positions under the water and return to normal outside the water. If you shine light through the water, it changes too. What gives? And when you shine light through certain pieces of glass, you can make colors of the rainbow. What is going on? What is light? The study of the properties of light is a very old subject, having found lenses that date as early as 750 BC. Numrud lenses are pieces of rock crystal that were used for magnifying or starting fires or maybe just to look good, the latter being the leading theory. In the periods between 494 to 434 BC, Empedocles invented the four element system of fire, water, air, and earth. He believed that light was fast moving fire atoms which shot out of our eyes. He could not explain why it was dark at night, but postulated that the sun rays must boost the eye beam somehow. About a century later, Euclid, 325-265 BC, realized this is nonsense because the stars are very, very far away, and if you close your eyes and then open them at the night sky, you will see light instantly, as opposed to having to wait for your eye beams to travel a very, very far distance. Despite Euclid's counterexample of the theory, the idea of eye beams stuck around for centuries. The work of Ptolemy, 100 to 170 AD, was one of the first explorations of the properties of light, studying reflection, refraction, and color. A handoff to the Islamic Renaissance, where Avinasa, 980 to 1037, observed that if the perception of light is due to the emission of some sort of particles by a luminous source, the speed of light must be finite. Hopping back to Europe, Theodoric of Freiburg, 1250 to 1310 was the first in Europe to correctly scientifically explain rainbows along with the Islamic world's Qut al-Din al-Shirazi and his student Kamal al-Din al-Falzi. Another 350 years later, Sir Isaac Newton, 1634 to 1727, investigated the refraction of light through a prism which decomposed the white light into a spectrum of color and with the second prism could return it back to white light. For most of the time that light has been studied, it has been thought to have been a particle. The majority of the work was about the geometry of the path traveled by a light particle. Newton called this particle a corpuscular, and it worked for most of his reflecting experiments, but he had some trouble explaining the diffusion, refraction, and interference of light. In order to explain light interference, Newton associated it with the idea that light was a wave, an idea that Newton did not like. This idea was presented to the world in 1678 by Christian Hierens. Written in his 1690 book, Treatise on Light, Hierens states within the thesis, quote, For I do not find that anyone has yet given a probable explanation of the first and most notable phenomena of light, namely, why it is not propagated except in straight lines, and how visible rays, coming from an infinitude of diverse places, 
cross one another without hindering one another in any way. Herrin explains that, quote, when one considers the extreme speed with which light spreads on every side, and how, when it comes from different regions, even from those directly opposite, the rays traverse one another without hindrance. One may well understand when we see a luminous object, it cannot be transport of matter coming to us from this object, in the way in which a shot or an arrow traverses the air, for assuredly that would too greatly impugn the two properties of light, especially the second of them. It is in some other way that light spreads, and that which can lead us to comprehend it is the knowledge which we have of the spreading of sound in the air. Hian's idea here was that light was always described by rays of light going from the source to the observer or to the observer to the source, and it was never really thought of like a wave as sound was. Imagine it like this. If a cricket was chirping in the middle of a dome, the sound it would make would push air outwards into a spherical direction. The sound waves will propagate through the room like a water wave. The air allows it to fill the dome above as well. If you were to replace the cricket with a source of light, you would expect a similar result. Although Newton did not like the idea of waves, it did allow a simple explanation for the refraction through a prism. It also explained the reason why it was difficult to focus all the colors together in a refracting telescope. To prevent this chromo aberration, Newton invented a type of reflecting telescope, now called a Newtonian telescope, and also created a new science called spectroscopy. 120 years later, William Herschel began construction on his 40-foot tall reflecting telescope. This led him to the discovery of sunspots and its effects on climate and wheat production, which today is ignored for its own set of eye beams. In order to test filters for looking at the sun, Herschel tested many different colors of filters, and he discovered that the red filters got very hot. I said we'd get back to temperature, and here it is. William Herschel on February 11th, 1800, 100 years after the invention of mercury and glass thermometers, and 2,000 years after the discovery of rainbows from prisms, Herschel used a prism to split the colors into their respective rays, and measured the temperature. As he had expected, red was warmer than all of the other colors. However, just outside of red, outside of the rainbow, it was even hotter. Herschel had just discovered that light doesn't stop just because you cannot see it anymore. This was where the exploration of light expanded from what we can see to the exploration of the invisible. In 1803, Thomas Young described his double slit experiment. Using the knowledge of water and sound waves and the work of Hurens, this work was finished later by Augustine Jean Fresnel, which was challenged by Simon Denis Poisson, who stated that if this wave thing were true, then there should be a light spot in the middle of a shadow of a circle. Thinking he had proved Fresnel's idea to be absurd, the demonstration that the point existed led to the light spot being called Poisson's spot, because scientists can be bullies too. Elsewhere, between 1802 and 1815, William Hyde Wollaston was using his own version of a spectrometer, an improved version of Newton's, to measure the sun spectrum, its rainbow, and discovered black lines in the spectrum that he could not explain. In steps Joseph von Frenhofer, who uses Fresnel's and Young's work to establish a quantified wavelength scale. He discovered that Wollaston's black lines are not boundaries in the nature of color, but are caused by something. Frenhofer did this by creating his own spectrometer. It was years after making glass and lenses, and having worked with heated glowing objects, he had decided to start studying that glow. For the next 40-some years, scientists of this branch enjoyed burning objects and studying the pretty colors that they made. Meanwhile, other scientists were playing with electricity, and some were playing with magnetism. In 1821, Hans Christian Orsten discovered the phenomenon of electromagnetism when his compass was affected by his electrical circuit. That is to say that he discovered that electrocurrents create magnetic fields. In December 1840, James Prescott Jewell suggested in an abstract that an electrical current could generate heat. Up until this point, thermodynamics and electrodynamics were not thought to be related to one another, not in any meaningful way. Then one day, electrodynamics, thermodynamics, and magnetism were all related in a very meaningful way. In 1859, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen 
burned enough things to discover that those dark lines are absorption lines. By using this method and a new scope, they discovered sodium in the sun. Kirchhoff's law of thermal radiation states, quote, For a body of any arbitrary material emitting and absorbing thermal electromagnetic radiation at every wavelength in thermodynamic equilibrium, the ratio of its emissive power to its dimensionless coefficient of absorption is equal to the universal function only of radiative wavelength and temperature. That universal function describes the perfect black body emissive power, end quote. Confusing? I think so, and I don't think I'm wrong in saying this, as for the next 40 years, black body radiation was not doing too hot, as the Raylan gene law that had followed created the ultraviolet catastrophe. The major thing to know about black bodies is something along the lines of everything glows by its own internal heat. In 1901, Max Planck solved the ultraviolet catastrophe by assuming that electromagnetic radiation can be emitted or absorbed only in discrete packets of energy called quanta. This gave the correct form of the spectral waveform seen here. The problem with the classical model was that it assumed that particles could exist at an infinite number of possible energy levels. By limiting the energy levels to whole integers and setting the minimum energy equal to the frequency of vibration times a very small number, Planck stated that E equals NHF, where E equals energy. N is any integer, F is the frequency of vibration, and H is a proportionality constant, which became known as Planck's constant. Planck's constant is the smallest unit of electromagnetic action at 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Even Planck did not believe this was true. Since the work of Young 100 years earlier, everyone was now assuming that light was a wave. This led to the discovery of radio waves. Snap forward 100 years to the writing of Planck's equation, and a young scientist by the name of Albert Einstein used Planck's idea of quanta and supposed that light was made of these quantum particles called photons. According to Planck's equation, E equals nHf. If we let n equal 1 for the lowest state of energy, we get E equals hf, and since h is a constant, this means that the energy of a quantum of light, or a photon, only depends on the frequency. But this means that a single quanta of energy is described by a wave characteristic, the frequency. A photon is a particle and can act like a wave. Einstein reconciled problems between Maxwell's equations and the law of Newtonian mechanics by fixing the mechanics at very high speeds. The idea was based on two simple ideas. One, the laws of physics are identical in all non-accelerating frames of reference. And two, the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, regardless of the motion of the light source or observer. Einstein used a thought experiment that involved a train that states something like this. If a train is moving at a constant non-accelerating speed of one half the speed of light, and a passenger on the train shines a light at a mirror, because he is not accelerating, then by postulate 1, physics is normal, and thus postulate 2 should hold that the light will travel normally to the mirror and back. Half of the speed of light is still a lot of speed, and anyone on this cosmic train station platform would witness the train travel 93,141 miles in one second or 299,792 kilometers in one second. This would be like watching the train pass by 11.75 Earths in one second. Note that special relativity is a special case of general relativity in which space-time is flat, but if we turned on these Earths' gravities, then we would be dealing with general relativity and acceleration. If the passenger pulsed the light at the mirror within that second to the person on the platform the light would still be traveling at light speed, which is twice as fast as the train and would appear to hit the mirror at an angle. This means that the light traveled at the same speed, but it appears to have taken longer in length or in time depending on where you witness the event. In order for the passenger to have witnessed seeing the light act normally, 
his clocks must have slowed down according to us here on the platform. The passenger would also experience his train as the same length as when he had gotten on, but from the given fact that light doesn't change speed in a vacuum, and that the event took one second for us, but less than a second for the passenger, then it can only be due to the fact that the train appears shorter to us than the passenger observes it. In fact, the passenger also appears skinnier in the direction he is traveling, according to us here on the platform. This means there is a direct connection between time and space, which acts in such a way as to allow the speed of light in a vacuum to never change. These two postulates of special relativity also predict the equivalence of mass and energy with the formula m equals e over c squared, or as most people know it, e equals mc squared. This means that anything with energy has an equivalent mass. Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect concretized this idea. Einstein did this by demonstrating that a photon carries all of its energy in a discrete wave packet, and that when this wave packet's energy is equivalent to the mass of an electron, that photon of light can remove an electron from a surface. A photon has no mass. It is not a small object, but rather it is a piece of energy and can exist in various quantized levels of energies. In September 1911, Niels Bohr applied this to Rutherford's brand new model of this new thing called an atom. Bohr used this atomic energy level and proposed that energy can excite an atom's electrons to higher energy states. When the atom re-releases that energy, it releases it as a certain frequency, some of which correspond to the visible light range. The excitation of an atom's electrons can cause the emission of light which answered the 100-year-old question of why hot objects glow. At the time, this was considered science fiction to most. Today, this knowledge is used for toys for children and cats. This brings us up to today, where the leading field is called quantum electrodynamics, which was called the jewel of physics by Richard Feynman because of how extremely accurate its predictions can be. All right, any questions? Uh, yeah. What is light? Yeah, right. Um, let's end it like this. Light is the electromagnetic radiation within a certain portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, the whole of which can be defined by the interaction of charged particles with the electromagnetic field. As the intensity of light diminishes, eventually one can see individual quantas of energy. These quanta are called photons and are created by perturbations in the motions of electrons and other charged particles. The simplest way to picture this would be to return to the days of candles and to examine one under this new understanding. A lit candle in a dark room appears to be surrounded in multiple spheres of light. A candle burns by heating the string or the wick. This heat has enough energy to turn solid wax into a vapor. These loose petroleum molecules are heated and, as told by the black body researchers, all that matters is the temperature, and at the brightest spot, the candle is around 1400 degrees Celsius, and to the eye that makes it white, as it is radiating all of the visible energy levels. Note, this is not the hottest spot, as heat and light both take from the same energy, and therefore, the spot that is turning the majority of its energy into heat is not turning that energy into light, and vice versa. Both the heat and the light radiate spherically outward in identical manners, except that their frequencies differ. The frequency of the heat is in infrared, and the light is in the visible electromagnetic end of the spectrum. If we consider just one sphere of radiation leaving the candle in all possible directions, and we expand outward with it, we will see that the energy becomes more spread out as the surface area of the sphere increases and soon we will see gaps developing. The individual energy packets between the gaps are called photons, and the energy of each photon relates to a frequency. Your eyes cannot see the heat, as humans do not have infrared vision, although your eyes do detect the heat as warmth, and can be cooked by too much exposure to that form of electromagnetic radiation. The frequency that our cones and rods can detect are actually the quanta energy levels required to cause a chemical reaction to the retinal molecule and have nothing to do with the detection of color. There are no electromagnetic colors, only different energy levels. Color is something your brain invented to interpret the different energy levels. This is how it is possible for some to hear or feel or taste color. 
they are not interacting with electromagnetic color by ear. Rather, it is the misintegration of various types of energies across multiple senses. The human eye evolved to see the majority of the electromagnetic wave packets that the 5,778 Kelvin black body sun outputs. When it comes to visible light, the human eye cannot detect single photons, and requires multiple retinal activations to stimulate the nerve cell which allows us to see. The human eye does not detect infrared, and that is likely due to adapting to sleeping all night and not needing to detect the glow of warm bodies, especially since we were developing some of the best daylight eyes in the animal kingdom. We can in fact see a tiny bit of the infrared, but the object has to be very warm, in a dark room, and will at most appear a very faint gray. Our retinal molecules are very sensitive to ultraviolet light, and it can cause phototoxicity. Our eyes and mind and skin evolved to detect levels of electromagnetic energies which were relevant due to the black body nature of a giant ball of fusing hydrogen. How then do we see color, and why do colors change as the sun moves across the sky? These questions cannot be answered by exploring light alone. The wave-like and particle-like natures of light will play a big role, but when it comes to how we see, the human brain plays just as big of a role. If you liked the video, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell. And if you like my work, why not put your money where your values are by supporting me on Patreon. Every time I've made a video so far, I have doubled my patrons. We are currently at four, and I'd hope to double it again.